My dearly beloved in Christ, the story of the wedding feast in today's gospel contains a wealth of messages for us. First, Christ shows how he respects and blesses the sanctity of marriage by his presence at the wedding of Cana. Second, his first miracle performed at that time foreshadowed his later institution of the Holy Eucharist. And thirdly, we're also shown the importance of the intercession of of the Blessed Virgin Mary in our spiritual life, and her power is given by God to be our mediatrix. We're all familiar with wedding celebrations, but most likely we've not experienced the extent to which such events were practiced at the time of Christ. Wedding feasts were events which afforded a chance to celebrate to the fullest and usually lasted an entire week. This was true of the poor as well as of the rich, each celebrating according to their means. Most towns or villages were small and ones in which their inhabitants knew each other. As a result, there was a large turnout at such events. At such an event, the feast centered around the abundance of wine that was offered to the guest. God had taught Moses how to make wine and had given it to man as a gift of joy in an otherwise difficult world. The Jews believe that without wine, there is no joy. This helps us to understand the seriousness of the situation of having run out of wine. The couple was poor and arranged for as much wine as was in their means, hoping it'd be enough. Sadly for them, it was not. Christ used this circumstance to show us many things, one of which is how very much he loves and respects his mother and how the Blessed Virgin Mary remains ever watchful in our side in order to help us in all our needs. It was a Blessed Virgin who, seeing that the wine was running out, acted to save the situation without being asked. She immediately turned to her son, her divine son, interceding on behalf of the young couple. What a beautiful lesson for us, knowing that we have such a loving mother to whom we can turn at all times. St. Bonabas says, If Mary well on earth was so compassionate, how much more so is she now reigning in heaven? With perfect confidence and faith in her son, Mary did not engage in a long discourse, but merely turned to Jesus and meekly said, They have no wine. This is an example of perfect faith, humility, and trust. Our Lady could have expounded upon the situation by saying that their relations, the couple, ran out of wine since they're poor and they should not be put to shame before their guests. She could have added that she knew Jesus was able to help them, for he's the Son of God, both kind and loving. Finally, she could have added that by performing a miracle, he could manifest to all that he was indeed the Messiah. Our Lady, however, did not waste time upon unnecessary words, but spoke briefly and with perfect faith and trust. She did not tell him what to do, but had confidence in his love and providence, which would come to aid the situation. Jesus, knowing full well the situation, because he's the Son of God, he knows everything. He knows they had no wine. He knew what he would do, chose to address the mother with the greatest respect, allowing us to see the importance she has regarding our spiritual and temporal life. Christ addressed her with the words, Woman, what is this to me and to thee? My hour has not yet come. And Protestants love to bring this out. Look, Jesus was really disrespectful, calling his mother woman. Okay, first of all, he's talking about the woman in Genesis 3.16, the woman that would crush Satan's head. And then from the cross, he also said, Woman, behold thy son. And Satan knows she's the woman. Because of the harshness of the English language, the meaning of the Aramaic term woman does not at all have the same connotation as that is in the English language. At that time, it was a sign of honor and respect. We simply do not know all the variations of meanings of some terms in foreign languages because we don't know the historical and cultural context 
in which languages function. This can make the meanings radically different. Those of you who are bilingual or multilingual have perhaps been asked by others to translate what was said in another language and put it into English. And it's, there's times, you know, ask, ask Father Hirano, can you, uh, he's trying to translate something from another language. Look, I can't do it. I don't know how to translate. To me, you want to understand it. Occasionally, it's nearly impossible to do so because the meaning or impact of the words is lost in the translation. An example of this is our word, lady. Here in the United States, it usually refers to a woman or to a polite woman. In England, however, it refers to a woman of high noble rank, carrying with it much more respect and meaning than merely our word of lady. Thus, the word woman, which Jesus used at Cana with reference to his mother, and again, when addressing her at the foot of the cross, was used as a form of highest respect and honor. Jesus followed the Ten Commandments of his Father to perfection and would not in the least have violated the Fourth, which commands us to honor thy father and thy mother. Another example of such misrepresentation of words is a phrase spoken by Jesus which is translated in English as, what is it to me and to thee? The literal translation of the Greek, word for word, is what to me and to you. In short, that means, what does that have to do with us? Further, in Hebrew, the word malesh is used, which has a meaning of, don't worry, But that's radically different from what the Protestants say. You know, you know, he's disrespecting his mother. She's not important. She's just an ordinary woman. This leaves us to view Christ's words as ones of great encouragement to his loving mother, not words of disrespect or unconcern. Thus you can see that the meaning of words vary to a great extent when taken out of context or when translated from one language to another. Knowing the person of Jesus and that of Mary, should be our main guide when we consider such things. When Jesus said, my hour has not yet come, he was referring to his passion in death. Even when the Jews wanted to seize Jesus, to stone him to death, he seemed to disappear because, as St. John says, his hour had not yet come. This explains the fact that this was only the beginning of his public life and not an indication that his mission was completed. In addition, St. Thomas, St. Cyril, and St. Jerome stated that our Lord anticipated the time for working miracles in order to honor his mother. Without any doubt in her mind or question remaining, Mary then turned to the attendants and told them, do whatever he tells you. Foreshadowing this transubstantiation of bread and wine in the sacrament of the Holy Eucharist, Christ then ordered the attendants to fill the six stone water jars with water, and then take them to the chief steward, whose duty it was to take charge of the festivities and see that there was sufficient food and drink. And I'd just like to close with this story. We're in the life of Sister Dominica of Paradiso. That She was born of poor parents in the village of Paradiso near Florence. From her very infancy, she began to serve Our Lady. She fasted every day in her honor, and on Saturday gave to the poor her food of which she deprived herself. Every Saturday, she went into the garden and into the neighboring fields and gathered all the flowers that she could find, presented them to an image of the Blessed Virgin with the child in her arms, which she kept in the house. One day, when Dominica was 10 years of age, Standing at the window, she saw in the street a lady of noble bearing, accompanied by a little child, and they both extended their hands, asking for alms. She went to get some bread, when in a moment, without the door being opened, she saw them by her side, and perceived that the child's hands and feet inside were wounded. She therefore asked the lady who had wounded the child. The mother answered, It was love. Dominican, flame with love at the sight of the beauty of the child, asked him if the wounds pained him. 
His only answer was a smile. But as they were standing near the statue of Jesus and Mary, the lady said to Dominica, Tell me, my child, what is it that makes you crown these images with flowers? She replied, It's the love I bear to Jesus and Mary. And how much do you love them? I love them as much as I can. And how much can you love them? As much as they enable me. Continue then, added the lady, continue to love them, for they will amply repay your love in heaven. The little girl then, perceiving that the heavenly fragrance came from those wounds, asked the mother with what ointment she anointed them, and if it could be bought. The lady answered, It is bought with faith and good works. Dominica then offered the bread. The mother said, Love is the food of my son. Tell him you love Tell him that you love Jesus, and he will be satisfied. The child at the word love seemed filled with joy, and turning toward the little girl, asked her how much she loved Jesus. She answered that she loved him so much that night and day she always thought of him and sought to give him as much pleasure as she possibly could. It's well, he replied, love him, for love will teach you what to do to please him. The sweet fragrance which exhaled from those wounds then increasing, Dominica cried out, This sweet aroma makes me die of love. What must heaven be? The scene now changed. The mother appeared clothed as a queen, and the child resplendent with beauty like the sun. He took the flowers and scattered them on the head of Dominica, who, recognizing Jesus and Mary in those personages, was already prostrate, adoring them. Then the vision ended. Dominica afterwards became a Dominican nun and died a holy death in the year 1553. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.